So hello everyone. Um, I'm happy to host Asaf. Uh, Asaf Noy is uh, adding uh, is adding the research in Alibaba Machine Intelligence Research Lab. Uh, his group conducts mainly deep learning research uh, from story to application in computer vision and natural language understanding. Previously co-founded a startup for stolen vehicle detection, researched and uh, con uh, consulted in the field of machine learning. Uh, Asaf holds bachelor's degree in electronical engineering and physics and a master's degree in machine learning theory, uh, always distinction from the Technion. Uh, so Asaf, the stage is yours. Thank you, Rad. I hope everyone uh, can hear me. Uh, I will uh, talk today about a recent theoretical work that we conducted in our lab. It's called a convergent theory towards practical over parameter type deep neural networks. And this is a joint work with uh, Jonathan Aflalo and Lee Selnik from the Israeli lab, as well as uh, Yi Shi and Rong Jin from the Alibaba Damo Seattle lab. Now, uh, this lecture uh, should have taken place one day after the NIP submission. And as you probably know, uh, it's been postponed by two days. So we have one more day to, 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 to fine tune our version. So any input today beside the question, I will be happy to, to hear uh, what you like, what interests more, what points are not well understood. Uh, on the other hand, maybe my slide won't be fine-tuned as I wished because I had uh, less time to work on those. Sorry for that. Uh, okay, let's start. Uh, before jumping into the, uh, the, the paper, I will just say a few words about our lab. So it's part of the Alibaba Damo Academy. Damo Academy is like uh, Microsoft Research, Google Research. It's the research branch of Alibaba focused on long-term research quantum computing, uh, biotech stuff, uh, autonomous cars, and of course, AI. And the Israeli lab is focused on AI with emphasis on computer vision. And uh, as the lab mentioned, I'm heading the research team. Um, part of what we do is writing papers. Uh, we are measured by that. It's a semi-academic uh, role. And we also do some, uh, we also offer grants to university in Israel. Actually, in the last, uh, the past three years, we work only with uh, Tel Aviv University. But in the next year, we're going to expand and uh, try to collaborate with other universities. So if you are professors and wish to collaborate, we can do that uh, later. You should just approach me. So our team focuses on mainly computer vision. Uh, most of our works are, are on the practical side. We try to improve deep learning architectures and training schemes. But the one I'm going to discuss about is mostly theoretical. OK, so somewhere in 2013, when I conducted my master, I remember this conversation exactly. A practitioner come and say, deep learning works. I just tested it. It works amazingly on MNIST. And my professor, a theoretician, said, well, it shouldn't. And what he meant by that? Well, deep learning models, uh, the, the first one, AlexNet, et cetera, are too, too big. They got plenty of parameters. We didn't understand how they can uh, general, generalize well, but few years after, people from the theory side have to admit it actually works. And what is interesting is that stuff has been reversed. Now the people from the theory side wants the network to be infinite for the theory to hold. And this is an actual gap that exists. Practitioners want a mild over-parameterization, and so practitioners want it to be infinite. So we want to actually help closing this gap. Uh, the problem I'm going to present is the most simple one you can think of, so you can uh, uh, dig deeper. We got a training stack of size n, and we train a fully connected deep ReLU network of width m and depth l. And for simplicity, we focus only on the regression task, probably the most simplest one, but most of the theory here uh, can be extended to classification and uh, multi-label classification, all the other easier, but maybe more empirically important tasks. We assume that the data is non-degenerate. So we don't have two examples with the exact same input and totally different output, which is a reasonable thing to assume. Consider a mild assumption. 
Now, when I talk about overparameterization, I want to put everything on the same axis so we'll understand the gap. So the three aspects of uh, deep or machine learning are expressivity. I got a model. Can someone, someone, not me uh, necessarily, fit the network to the train set? So the final loss will be zero. Okay, I don't know how to do it, but is it possible to find a set of parameters that optimize the, over the train? Trainability, we will discuss this uh, mainly today. Will the network fit the train set given a structure and optimization algorithm? Okay, now we are in charge to do the optimization from a random initialization, we want to achieve a zero train loss. And of course, the holy grail is generalizability. Will the network fit the test set, the distribution, right? This is a more uh, 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 tough problem. We're not gonna deal with it uh, specifically today, but of course, we're gonna test our methods also on the test sets, okay? By the way, uh, every like two or three slides, I'm gonna stop for questions. It's gonna happen soon. So feel free to interrupt me then. So putting these on the uh, overparameterization level, from one hand, we can say that practical networks, it depends on the domain, but let's say computer vision, we got ImageNet with one million uh, examples. We need uh, networks of 10 million, 100 million parameters in order to feed those. I will call that uh, omega of n. It's not exactly, but it's not omega of n to the, to the fifth. That's what I meant. Expressivity is quite solved. It's the most easy problem. We got good uh, lower bounds. Uh, Yun and others uh, show that a square root of the number of example in a not that deep network can, can overfit ImageNet to the fullest, okay? You get zero train loss even on larger data sets, and this is quite solved. But what about trainability? Now, this is interesting, okay? Now I'm talking about the width of the network, not the number of parameters. The number of parameters in a fully connected network is the square of the width, right? Because it's a full, full rank matrices. So it began with Aurora in 2017. He demanded uh, simply M to be infinite. It's got better in the past recent years. And one, we, we stand on uh, network width, again, of n uh, uh, in the power of 8 and l in the power of uh, 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 12. And if you take this to uh, a specific scenario of fitting a large ResNet on ImageNet, you get something like 10 in the power of 170 much, much larger than what we can do in practice, okay? So this is a major gap that we wish to solve. And why do we want that? Smaller gap lead to better understanding and this can lead to better algorithms, better training schemes, you name it, right? It's gonna help us a lot to better uh, capture theoretically what is happening in ReLU network, at least on the uh, optimization side. By optimization, I mean optimize the train sets. Okay, uh, any questions, anyone? Okay, so I'll proceed. We wish now to suggest maybe, oh, uh, before that, I'm gonna talk about why. Why do they want the network to be so big? And I don't have time to go into details, but I give you the, the intuition, okay? So let's look at the two graphs below. In this graph, three fully connected uh, networks were trained, but with different widths from 10 to the 1,000. And as, you, as we can see, uh, the train loss is always uh, reach uh, zero, not that impressive, but in the green one, the, 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 the most wide one, it does it very fast. I don't mean it that they are good in general because they contain many parameters. Maybe in, 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 in runtime, it's not that good. But is it interesting? Why did it happen? The right graph is even more interesting. It's, it's uh, in the y-axis, you can see the percentage of change in the parameters. We see the L2 norm in a nominator between the final and the initial weights normalized by the initial weights. That the percentage of change of the weights and we see that the green one, which is not that wide, uh, 
it's almost zero. So the, the, the mean uh, weight did not uh, move the lot, okay? This thing is going to zero as the network approach infinity. Any questions? Okay, we, conclu we can conclude that the sum of all microscopic changes yield a one microscopic effect, right? We overfit the network, this is good, but we don't move a lot. So think about the, the weight uh, uh, space, right? I'm of course plotting for two weights, but it's uh, different behavior in uh, larger dimensions. So we got the initialization. This is the, uh, the point in the middle. And we move a little bit, right? Uh, in, in, a, in a small sphere that we can calculate its uh, radius. It's very small compared to the initialization line, which is, again, not that small uh, by itself. It's normalized to one. Um, and what is um, maybe characteristic of all the proofs of order parameterization is the two properties. First, these spheres tend to grow, uh, tend to shrink with M. So it's very small. And the second property is that inside this sphere, the objective is semi-smooth. It gives us good optimization properties. We can optimize the route of the gradient is pretty regular. They're not going doing a lot of these and, and, and essentially overfit the data. Any questions? Okay. So we want to propose a slightly different uh, variant of Relu network. We want to capture the, uh, its behavior, but change it a, a little bit. Inject uh, properties that we are uh, wish that Relu networks have in order to improve theoretically and maybe even empirically the result of Relu network. So you can see Relu activation uh, given a vector x as a Hadamard uh, uh, pointwise multiplication of x uh, by x is uh, larger than zero, right? This is Relu. And you can think about an extension that we call gated or G ReLU as uh, decoupling it to two vectors. One is in charge of the value passed or not. And the other one is in charge of whether or not to pass the, the value. This is what we call activation, okay? Uh, and this uh, decoupling is by no means new. Few works before indicated that and try to utilize it for several uh, things. Uh, uh, people from the Hebrew University uh, took it to the expressiveness uh, of uh, different networks, and we take it to the optimization one and suggest uh, maybe a setup. This is a setup that includes ReLU and different other variants, okay? So before we, I, I talk about GRLU zero, let's talk about this graph. Okay, so we got the weights of the, of the network and we got the activation. We did this decouple. Psi now in charge wholly on the activation. And the GRLU function is what I just mentioned. Uh, two inputs are getting in, one decided if the other one will uh, pass through or not. Okay, so ReLU network can be achieved in this setup if we just copy the weights W into, into Psi. Right, it will be the same. Let's do every, after every gradient uh, step, we can copy the weights and then we got the, uh, the usual ReLU network. But we can do something different. We can fix everything that is red. By the way, the, the input and output layers are just random projection to fit the dimension. I'm gonna uh, negligible those for the rest of the lecture. So if we uh, set all the size we initialize them with independent uh, uh, initialization and just kept them fixed, we're getting ReLU zero, okay? What is the zero stand for? We can and might add later an additional signal which will take place of the zero, okay? This is one thing that we, we understood that if you, if you decouple stuff, you can inject an other input to the two different variants. Okay, it's like uh, noising an image, but without affecting the actual values, only giving the regularization effects. Okay. So what, what does it give us to be in the GRLU zero network? What we wish to hope for? We wanted good optimization properties and we achieved some of them. The first is bias shift. 
making a lot of headlines these days. Uh, there is a new paper by DeepMind. They removed the batch normalization uh, that actually fix bias or mean shifts uh, and reach state of the art results of ImageNet. It's a quite uh, uh, extensive research on, on this topic. And uh, this is the definition of bias shift. And um, you are all familiar with it, I assume. And this network does not suffer from bias shifts at all because positive or negative values are passing through, right? Anyway, any, any value can pass through and the independency between the two networks leads to that, that there is no uh, um, bias to, to, to positive or negative. I won't uh, go inside the proof, but it's quite straightforward. Dying values is a different problem that really networks suffer from, and it's quite solved by, by uh, uh, residual connections. If you take a fully connected rally network without any tricks like residual connection and make it very, very deeper, this network will essentially um, uh, uh, converge to a fixed function that doesn't do a lot. And it, this is called dying ReLU. The ReLU getting stuck in the non-activated regime and then the gradient of that zero and it getting stuck there. Our network does not suffer from that as well. So it is immune to bias shift and dying values. And we had the hypothesis that these two um, uh, properties are related to why we need infinitely wide networks, okay? Because we, we, we thinking about stuff uh, in the worst case mean. So there are vanishing gradients, bias shift, etc. Okay, so getting back to the same uh, graph, g values activations are identical to the one at initialization. They are not changed by design, allowing improved value optimization, right? So in the circle I, I depicted uh, before, now we got two points. One is, is, is not moving from the initialization. The other one with the value of the same sphere can move and reaches the global minima. And we shall see. Any questions? Okay, so theorem one, uh, the main theorem, uh, we got a network initialized with a G ReLU zero uh, setup uh, mentioned before with some learning rate and width that is uh, squared by N and linear with L. L is the depth again. And, and this network uh, uh, convergence to the global minima, right? Achieve trainability very fast in logarithmic time in the number of epochs, okay? So if to put it uh, in the overparameterization uh, axis, we are somewhere here. Uh, somewhere near the practice, not exactly there, of course, it is still too big to be practical, but it's quite semi-practical. Now I must say, it's not uh, kosher maybe to put it next to ReLU networks because this is not a ReLU network, right? This is a, a, a different variant. Maybe I should, uh, I should compare it to linear networks that converge very fast, but has limited equipism, right? So in order to, to maybe to make it kosher, to show you why I, I talk about these two, I'm gonna talk about transition between them and the generalization ability of the GRLU networks. Questions? Okay. I'm gonna skip the neural tangent kernel, but this is a complementary theorem to the one I just mentioned. Uh, we're getting an NTK regime very fast, okay? Linearly with a number of examples. Now, we, we took the GRLU0 uh, variant, tried it in practice, and not that surprisingly, it was uh, not that good as ReLU network. It is pretty hard to pass ReLU network's uh, performance. Um, it's not uh, surprising if everyone used this network um, or variants of it. So we use the additional signal that you can see here, uh, XTAG, in order to inject additional, uh, let's call it information, in order to regularize, regularize the network, okay? Uh, the additional signal can be anything. If you can think about images in the input, it can be distorted images, augmented images, so the, so the uh, activation and value layers won't see the same values. But we started uh, simply 
with just noise. What we want is to, um, we want the, the activation not to be fixed, for example. We don't want them to co-adapt the data set, right? We want to noise things a, a little bit so the weights will, uh, will take that into account and generalize better, okay? And this is uh, some, can be seen like a, some kind of a drop out or drop pass, right? You, you put an input noise in the size of M and then it goes through all these matrices and these uh, activation are changing. But unlike a uh, drop pass, it changes as a function of the input itself because it's being added to the input and also all the fixed activation layer of Psi. Okay, so it's quite different from the regular uh, drop pass. And, and we do the experiments and try with uh, different noise, noise that changed binomically those uh, Z, like, just like a drop path, and it didn't work that well. So maybe there is something about uh, co-adapting the signal and the noise. Also, this is a symmetric change, right? Uh, initially, about 50% of any activation in a large network were on and the other were off. We change it in a symmetrical way, so the fraction keep the same. We don't need to multiply by a factor like drop path, et cetera. And it's quite interesting if we're gonna succeed here and get a good generalization, that let's say just like ReLU, it's an interesting ob observation, I think, that one can pick, pick any random uh, size, right? Random activation, maybe use the same for different data sets and then generalize uh, good with that, changing only the values. You can think of a multitask setup where all the tasks are initialized with the same activation network and share those so it can uh, boost performance. You can think about transfer learning. When, the, when you do the transition from the large to the small data set, the downstream one, you change only the values in order to overfit less. Okay, this is one variant, the regularized GRLU. We call it GRLU sigma square. Now, what about hybrid uh, modes? The GRLU setup contains ReLU networks and GRLU networks, right? And we can mix those. We can actually do a ReLU to GRLU for fine tuning, right? We train the ReLU, we change in the gates in the usual way. Then at some point we fix them and use GRLU as a fine tuner, okay? This is quite trivial how to do that. We just copy the weights to the size, right? in the setup and, that, and, and then just fix it, okay? Doing it untrainable. And it's uh, well, quite, uh, quite amazingly in practice. In all the four data sets we tried, it's improved the ReLU. Uh, the second thing we can think of is GRLU to ReLU as improved initialization. And this can be interesting also for, from the uh, theoretical perspective, right? It's quite hard sometimes to take a deep ReLU network and train it. Sometimes in our experiments, it's getting stuck, okay? At the beginning of the training and doesn't move a lot, okay? We need to, to initialize it several times in order to, to kick back to good accuracies. So we use GRLU to get to a good initial solution and then uh, train from them with the ReLU. This, this again works better than GRLU by itself and also a little bit uh, more than few tries of ReLU until we achieve the best results. And how do we how do we do it? I mean, GRLU with fixed activation is not a simple transform just to ReLU, right? We need to project the fixed uh, activation onto the values because the ReLU uh, uses the same weights for both. So for that, we got theorem two, and it essentially uh, by construction say we got a good way to do the projection. So the resulting ReLU network will have the same intermediate tensors along the network. And of course, the same outputs over all the training examples. So it's, uh, you can think about it as the twin ReLU network. Over the, twins, uh, the train set, it got the same footprint, but over the, the test set, it might be different. And as we shall see, it has kind, some kind of a regularization effect that the boost performance uh, additionally. Any questions about the uh, hybrid mode? 
Okay, so we move to experiments. I got few. It's a little bit uh, unordered because we're just uh, making these. Uh, the first thing that we, we see when we train a JIRA network that it doesn't depend on the train side. The convergence is, is, is much more, uh, let's say, regular or stable. We see less jumps. And it's uh, maybe straightforward because we're not changing the gates. All the changes are more smooth. So we're kind of expecting that, but it's nice to see it in practice. What about real results? So this is a uh, two data set, a superconduct, which is a popular regression data set. And of course, C for 10, you all know. Uh, we, we plot the train and the test error for each, left and right. And as you can see here, we just compare a ReLU to GRLU network, uh, GRLU is sigma square. It's, by the way, the same value in all the plots I'm going to show. Uh, and, and, and the GRLU um, doing a better work, I would say, uh, slightly better MSC. Let's call them uh, comparable. But it's quite well, because it doesn't overfit a lot, as we might suspect that uh, a network that does a very good optimization will do. Uh, for CIFAR, again, let's look at the test accuracy on the right. Uh, we see here, of course, the in, in green, the GRLU zero, right? This is the overfitting version with the strong theoretical guarantees. It doesn't work that well in practice, as we see. It's uh, doing uh, major overfitting, I would say. Uh, above that, you can see the ReLU in, uh, in yellow and uh, GRLU sigma square achieving better and more stable uh, optimization path than ReLU. I'm not saying that it's gonna be happening in any other data set. We haven't checked it. It's mostly a theoretical work. We haven't went still to ImageNet, et cetera. And we actually believe that if we're gonna add batch normalization to the ReLU network and residual connection and, and convolutional layers, it's gonna get better. Some of the advantages of GRLU gonna shrink, but it's still interesting. Uh, and this, about, this is for the, the uh, uh, hybrid models. So SGAM is another large uh, regression uh, data set. Here we, we, we train ReLU in, in, uh, in yellow. Um, in uh, blue, we got the GRLU sigma square and also in green, the, the hybrid, right? We, we start with ReLU and then move to GRLU as a fine tuner as we see that uh, GRLU achieve better than the ReLU, but the hybrid version keeps improving the results, okay? Is it true for the train? Oh, actually, yeah. And actually uh, for the test as well, you can see that it's more noisy, right? Uh, because we had the Sigma square, it's not as surprising, but still we get a better optimization path. Uh, and this is the other way around, ReLU to GRLU. We do the transform in the middle exactly in the middle epoch, we transition from ReLU to, uh, from uh, GRLU to ReLU. Oh, th this is a mistake, by the way. This is uh, GRLU to ReLU. Sorry for that, I need to fix that. So we, we, we start with, uh, with GRLU to get a good initial solution. Then we switch to ReLU and we get in a comparable, uh, I would say, behavior uh, uh, results to the just use ReLU but we don't need to initialize the ReLU a few times. And we suspect that we can prove also the, the theoretical bounds on ReLU when we can assume stuff about a good initialization, good condition number, good PL condition, et cetera. I will skip that. Okay, so I will summarize and take questions. We suggest a novel setup. This is the G ReLU, and this is like a family of model, ReLU, other kind, some kind of a GRLU with or without injected noise. Uh, one variant, which is simple, lead to semi-practical convergence bound, right? Larger, but not by much from what we, we, we do in practice, mild over parameterization. A regularized variant getting us actually good empirical results. Uh, and also uh, we got the hybrid models that take maybe uh, the best of both, both worlds from ReLU and GRLU. And we wish that uh, this can be taken forward and, and improve the empirical result of ReLU and also the theoretical bounds. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna conclude with that. Thank you for listening.
Okay, and any questions, uh, remarks are welcome. So these results are uh, for uh, the trainability, right? Yes, yes. Can you, can you say something about the generalization or? Uh... We haven't went uh, to that. You know, there is no generalization bound like a global one in deep learning, like, right? This is the holy grail. So one paper at a time. We are focused on optimization. We wanted to close the optimization gap. We wanted to show that if you do a slight modification to value, you can still have good results, but theoretical guarantees and generalization is next. Uh, this is something that we actually work on these days. Hmm. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, so uh, thank you, Asaf. Uh, it was a very interesting lecture and uh, talk and good luck with uh, the submission to NIPS. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, if you got further questions, we can take them offline. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, thank you for having me, Elad. Okay, thank good you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.